Good morning. Today I'd like to talk about cerebral palsy and in our clinical conditions class. So I thought I would go over the PowerPoint information as presented and we'll watch some videos during the PowerPoint as well. So let me go ahead and share my screen. So cerebral palsy. We know that this is a disorder that affects um, typically motor skills and it's a sensory motor disorder. And we'll learn more about the symptoms and the incidence and prevalence as we go along the content. So let's get a picture. I forgot to put the link in this slide, but I already have it pulled up here. So I'll go back to this. So I don't remember his last name, but Josh is a um, comedian with cerebral palsy, and he tours the country providing um, comedy shows uh, typically based around his disability. And so I hope you, I'm going to start at about um, a minute 44 in so we can kind of avoid the ads and some stuff and, and um, we'll go for a few minutes into it. It is fun, man. I love telling jokes. <laughs> I do a lot of shows. I uh, travel all over this beautiful country of ours, and uh, I've been seeing more handicap accessible stuff going in everywhere. Is, yeah, it's great. Really well needed. But I, I got to tell you, as a physically disabled person, I kind of feel obligated to use that stuff. <laughs> You know how awkward that is? Sorry. When I'm on a date and uh, I have to use the ramp, you know. <laughs> I'll be there in a minute, baby. Uh, this, this Walgreens is up on a hill, I don't know. Uh, oh, honey, let me get the door for you. <laughs> Who, says, Who says chivalry is dead, huh? <laughs> I'm sure, uh, sure glad we got cell phones. Uh, you know, we've come a long way. The flip phone was no good for me. That, uh, <laughs> I miss a lot of cold calls with that one, you know? <laughs> Gotta get an oyster sucker to open it. <laughs> You're still better than when you had to write down your number and give it to a girl. Like, uh, okay, uh, let me get you my number. I gotta get this stack of paper here. Uh, seven. <laughs> Nine sheets later, like, here you go, baby, don't mix them up. <laughs> I went to New York recently and I tried to hail a taxi and I caught a pigeon. Like, oh. <laughs> So as you can, you can tell by his mannerisms that he obviously has uh, physical um, impairments and of course his sense of humor is soundly intact. So we can appreciate that. 
So here, here's another person's cerebral palsy story, and um, we might get a good visual too of how a person afflicted with this disorder may appear. I'm just more middle of the road. Barbara Boyer, not who she says she is. Certainty in all times. Savings. Capital Federal. True Blue for over 125 years. My name is Scott Price and this is my daughter Victoria. She's 15 years old and a freshman at Andover High School. Local person, Andover. Victoria's diagnosis is uh, cerebral palsy. She's known as a spastic quad and uh, she has very limited use of her arms and legs and uh, uses her power chair with her head. The first time we ever did anything with standing was in preschool. They had, a, at that time, they had a Riften stander and um, it was a supine stander that they put her in and that's what they did at school and we didn't have anything at home. And um, once we got out of preschool, they didn't do much at school, so then we pursued our own standing through the therapists at Gillette Hospital and uh, they did an evaluation and uh, we determined that a, a stander where we could actually get her up was easier than putting her in a supine stander because that was too much work for us. So Victoria got this stander paid for through her insurance. The, um, the therapist took the time to write up the letter of medical necessity and we gave them the input that we could from home in terms of how we thought it would benefit her and um, through some trials, we actually had to do a trial. We were able to determine that that was a good thing for her and, and how it would help her. Some of the health benefits that we've noticed are um, things like stronger muscles in her legs. When we go to the, um, get her braces adjusted, the orthotists will comment that, that she must be in a standard. They can tell by looking at her legs, so they're very impressed that they can see that. And the other thing that's really a great benefit for her oh. is that she remains yeah, come on in. in her body. Yeah, come on in. Hello? Oh, I, um, I think I'm okay for now. Thank okay. you. Yep. Mm -hmm. And let's. Sorry, I'm <clears throat> had a brief interruption there. Bowel program, which is a thing that you don't really expect, but it's really a helpful thing for her. I think one of the psychological benefits might be when she's actually doing something like baking, because when you're baking in the kitchen, you're standing, and so she's sort of used to, to being up in the stander and, and working with mom or one of her aides, and, and she's at their level. The other thing that's really helpful for her is that she likes to change her position. If you're in a chair all day long, it gets old, and she gets tired of that, so she actually asks to be in her stander. So I think that by being in her stander, it helps her not only change her body but sort of her uh, frame of mind of how she's feeling about her day. Vicki's current standing program involves uh, about an hour or more depending on how long she can tolerate after school. She comes home every day and we get her off the bus and if she has homework she might get up in her stander and work on her homework or she might play games with her little brothers or even with me if no little brothers are available. And then one of her favorite activities is to uh, bake. So if we're not doing any of the games, she'll get out some baking and make us some really good food. Some of the other things that Victoria does is she goes to uh, horse therapy in the summer and the fall. She loves to get up on a horse. Once a week, she goes out to a ranch and they get her up on the horse and they walk her for about an hour and she looks forward to that every week and it, it helps loosen up her tone. And um, she also has a service dog. Uh, we've had a service dog now for about a, a year and a half. Can you wait a minute? We've had a service dog now for about a year and a half. His name is Hajik, and he helps her by opening and closing doors, picking things up off the floor, 
He will also calm her in places where things are kind of boring, maybe school or going to church. He helps keep her calm. Hajik, here, up, come on, up. That's it, good boy. He's her constant companion, and his technical name is that he's a skilled companion, so in addition to all of the tasks that he does for her, he facilitates communication with people in public, because people don't generally talk to a person in a wheelchair, but um, if the, there's a dog, people love to come up and pet the dog, so we make them talk to her and ask them, ask her if she can, if they can pet the dog, and then uh, he facilitates those communications that way. Okay, here we are in Andover, Minnesota at the Andover Lands, and I'm here with Scott Price and Vicki Price, and we're bowling out of a wheel. I thought it was Andover, Kansas, but I guess it's Andover, Minnesota. <laughs> you can see how her um, visual, um, her visual attention changed, her verbalizations changed when he started talking about the horses and the hippotherapy's horse therapy, um, and then also about her doggy and stuff. Chair. Yeah. Can you tell us a little bit about it, Scott? Well, Victoria has the ICANN bowling arm, and she uses that, which attaches to the front of her chair. I see it snaps onto the wheelchair with these two clamps, not real tough. Nope. And then just a couple of alignments. They've got a couple of levels here set so that you can make sure that it's level, and you're ready to go in about 30 seconds. And I understand that your bowling team helped you buy this little bowling piece. We did the research over the winter on the internet and found the ICANN bowling arm and asked the bowling coach if the team could help us out. And she did some research, checked out with her uh, supervisor and found out that they would purchase it and they're letting us use it during the off season. She drives her power chair with her head and when she takes the, ball, the chair down the lanes towards the pin, the momentum of the ball going, when the chair stops, takes the ball down the ramp and towards the pins. So, let's kind of get a look at it. Actually, the ball sits up here. She'll move the chair, and then when she stops the chair, it'll rip down the, the chute and down the lane, and so she can actually uh, kind of angle the chair to get a, a guy in a shot. She can. Now she can run the chair or you can run the chair? Victoria's chair can be driven either by an attendant, and so I can drive and help her get lined up, or she can drive it herself if we set it to the proper uh, mode, and then she can drive, and she's the one that actually drives the chair down towards the pins. And how is she How is she doing that? How is she driving the, the chair? Victoria drives her chair with her head array, so she uses this pad here to either go forward or reverse, and when she's driving her own chair, she uses the side pads to turn, Right now, she can't quite do the side turning, so we just allow her to drive towards the pin. Amazing. Is there anything else that you can think of that we should tell them since you've got your wheels a-turning? Yeah, I don't think they care about that. She said that her teachers are going to have a baby, but <laughs> that's not what they're after here, kiddo. <laughs> but that is important to you, isn't it? Yeah. So cute, so cute. Okay, let me go back to the PowerPoint. So the description for cerebral palsy, it's not a specific condition, but a rather a group of clinical syndromes that affect movement, muscle tone and coordination as a result of an injury or lesion to, of the immature brain. It is not considered to be a disease. Here we go, let's watch another little video of an overview. My name is Dr. Lucinda Carr. I'm a pediatric neurologist at Great Ormond Street Hospital for Children in London. Cerebral palsy is a definition, it's an umbrella term that describes a persistent disorder of movement or posture that's caused by an abnormality of the brain, of the immature brain, which is non-progressive. Cerebral palsy is surprisingly common in that its incidence is about one in 400 live births, but obviously it can range in severity from mild to severe. It can be due to many different causes. Um, a number of those occur 
before the time of birth, in fact the majority. Sometimes this is due to the development itself in that the brain does not develop normally. Sometimes that's due to genetic causes. Sometimes it's because there has been some um, infection or trauma when the child is developing in the womb. A smaller proportion are due to problems around the time of birth, although this in fact is quite uncommon. Um, the highest risk group are children who are born prematurely, and in fact around 40% of children with cerebral palsy have been born prematurely. Often we know that a child's high risk of cerebral palsy, for example the child that's been on a special care baby unit and early ultrasound scans of the brain have shown that there's some damage, so we know that they're at high risk and we would screen those sort of children carefully. Sometimes it's picked up that there are problems during the pregnancy, again, so we know that the child's at high risk. But there can be signs when the baby is born that, that things are not quite right. Sometimes they have fits in the early period, which again are a bit of a warning sign. Sometimes it can just be noted as the child begins to develop that there are problems with their movement. For example, they're not moving their hands and legs normally, or when the time comes when you'd be expecting them to walk, so the milestones that a health visitor would screen you for, they're not acquiring their milestones, so they're maybe not sitting at the right time or walking at the right time. Once the diagnosis of cerebral palsy is made, the child will then be involved with the local child development team usually. And in this group, they will meet a number of professionals who can help with the difficulties they're encountering. Particularly, this is the doctor and a physiotherapist in the first instance, but sometimes we need other people to help, such as speech therapists or occupational therapists, psychologists. Our aim is obviously to identify what particular things the child finds difficult and try and help them with this. The common aim is to try and help the child achieve their full potential. To help the child in their movements, to keep the muscles strong and of good length. Because one of the risks of cerebral palsy is that because the muscles aren't working normally, they become short, contractures can develop, and sometimes orthopedic surgery is needed. So we try and delay this by doing stretching and strengthening exercises, using splints and orthotics where necessary. In some instances, we inject the stiff muscles with botulinum toxin to relax them. Occasionally, more specialised treatments are indicated, but these are only in specialist centres. A number of children will go on to need orthopaedic surgery to lengthen the muscles. As they grow older and go into adult services, we look carefully at what's called the transition into adult services and try and look at what their needs might be as young adults, again, and maintaining their independence as much as possible. Most young people with, ad with cerebral palsy are fully independent and have full active lives. So in describing cerebral palsy, I think it's important to be aware that it can range from very mild to really very severe. There's a lot we can do in helping uh, improve the problems that occur with cerebral palsy. In the most severe cases, there is only a limited amount one can offer sometimes in terms of improving the mobility, but there is quite a lot we can do in terms of comfort, care of the child and giving them the best quality of life possible. For more information, visit www.nhs.uk. My name is Dr Lucinda Carr. So that kind of gave us an, another example of a person um, who is mildly impaired. You saw the severe impairment with Vicky's story um, up to the mild impairment with the little girl walking. We don't know her cognitive status. And then also I would consider probably the comedian mildly impaired too. Doesn't seem to, um, he doesn't seem to have cognitive limitations as well. So what's the difference between cerebral palsy and say traumatic brain injury, stroke, or dementia. So it's an adult brain in those others with stroke, dementia versus the immature brain injury. 
and um, what's the difference between cerebral palsy and intellectual disability. Remember, those had three criteria. The age was just diagnosed, that it's non-progressive, and the level of IQ, and then autism we haven't discussed yet, but that's more of a set of behaviors for people and not necessarily tied to sensory motor skills. Um, let me move my little thing around here. So cerebral palsy affects muscle control versus cognition or speech on the others. This bar is kind of a pain. Let me put it to the side. Nope. Okay. Criteria for CP. So the brain's developing when it occurs. It's non-progressive, sensory motor in nature, meaning that it has sensation and physical skills that are intertwined with it and the disorder originates in the brain it's lifelong so first it occurs when the brain's still developing so it can develop prenatally so meaning before birth or in the womb perinatally during or around the time of birth postnatally after birth two to five years um, experts have disagreed typically on where to draw the line so the perinatal remember um, during or around the time of birth, there's a lot of things that can happen as a child is born. And so sometimes lack of oxygen or actual physical insult to brain, to the brain with either forceps or vacuum or, or lack of oxygen um, definitely can make a difference and stuff. Although it's not as high as you would think. So it's non-progressive, it doesn't get worse, although characteristics may change over time versus their tone, I mean, meaning like their tone, posture, that type of stuff. It's sensory motor in nature, so they have abnormal muscle tone, meaning um, muscle tone is the amount of muscle contraction that we have at rest. And so we all have a certain amount of tension anyway, and um, because just to keep upright against gravity, but if we get too high, it becomes contracted, and if it's too low, it becomes loose and floppy. So we have abnormal control of that movement, abnormal sensation, sometimes, always, also, and then severity can be mild to severe. It originates in the brain. The muscles are normal. The nerves are normal. So this is very different from our neurodegenerative disorders and our progressive uh, neurogenic disorders as well. It's the brain signals that are being sent that are abnormal. It's a lifelong disability and the lifespan is within normal limits. So, you know, typically people will pass away from other issues such as um, pneumonia or, um, you know, infections and stuff from the cubidae. So a few premature babies have temporary movement difficulties. Uh, during their first year of life as they kind of get caught up on the developmental uh, scale, but, um, but it's not classified as cerebral palsy if they go away. So when does a brain injury, brain injury occur? Prenatally in a majority of 70% of the cases. So we don't know when and what the exact cause is, what's the risk factors, um, but one risk factor alone may not be enough to cause damage. So there are other strong risk factors, such as prematurity and low birth weight, and, um, but like we said, that, not we haven't said, but what comes first? Because they were born earlier or because they, have, they were so tiny when they were born. So go ahead and make sure you check out table 2.1 in our book. About 10% of the cases are actually po uh, post-birth injuries causing CP. So typically uh, after a baby's born and is developing, they may have a stroke, they may have an infection such as meningitis or encephalitis, they may get into some type of poison, they may have trauma, near drowning that causes anoxia to the brain and uh, global deficits, strangulation, for example, going, um, you know, um, I think I mentioned the other day about uh, back in the olden days when the crib slats were too far apart, you know, they would get their body down through the crib slats, but their head would be caught. So as an example, endocrine disorders and other unknown causes. Incidence and prevalence. 
3.1, 3.6 per 1,000 people. It's more common in boys, African American uh, ethnicity, and multiple births. Advancement. So people who maybe are on fertility treatments and have, uh, you know, quintuplets and triplets and five babies, you know, a lot of babies, they have a higher incidence that they may have a cerebral palsy. So advancements in OB and neonatal care hasn't decreased its incidence. So that's kind of interesting, right? Because if you think, well, we're doing better on our prenatal information, we do prenatal vitamins, we know not to drink and smoke, and there's a lot of things that we're doing much differently now. And, uh, but the reason why in our book, it states that more people, more babies survive nowadays before the day the babies would not survive and so the actual so even though the care is getting better so that should that's bringing the number down but the actual numbers that are surviving are going up so i don't know if that makes sense to you but so that's why the numbers aren't showing that signs and symptoms as I mentioned before, that tone abnormalities, reflex or abnormalities, postural abnormalities, delayed motor development, atypical motor development. So tone abnormalities, as I mentioned before, we all have muscle tone. If we have too much tone, it's called hypertonicity. That's our spasticity. That's where it involuntarily contracts into typically flexion, but it can also be into extension uh, patterns. We have hypotonicity, low floppy muscles, loose, lax joints, those types of things, or fluctuating, or it goes from a spastic movement right into, um, you know, a hypotonic movement. <clears throat> so just a couple of little things here. I can't find a good spot for this. I don't know how to minimize that bar. So we'll learn someday, right? So idle speed of a muscle, Excuse me. Muscle tone can be characterized as that degree of resistance when a muscle is stretched. Reflex abnormalities. Hyperreflexia, so they just may be very, very sensitive to any type of reflexes that we have. For example, the Babinski, um, you know, when you touch the bottom of the foot, your little toes spread, those um, all sorts of reflexes and stuff. Clonus is a reflex abnormality that continues to present, uh, present with a lot of people with cerebral palsy. So let's go ahead and watch a demo of it. We expected our officials in Washington to be there for us. Instead, right, Congressman ask. Roger Marshall used the moment to help himself. He co-sponsored a bill that would allow him to personally profit on his investments in healthcare companies. It doesn't get much worse than that. This video will introduce you to Clonus. Clonus is something that is seen in upper motor neuron lesions during spasticity of muscles and spasticity of nerves. To perform a Clonus test, you want to support the distal end of the lower extremity of the patient and with your other hand you want to forcibly dorsiflex the patient's foot like so during an upper motor neuron lesion in what's called clonus the patient's foot will then plantar flex uncontrollably almost in a tremor state for so many seconds you want to note if it's there and how many seconds it occurs in your soap note So I am going to um, I'm going to pause the recording for just a moment, just to make sure that we are recording. You see the recording? Okay, I was just wanting just to make sure. So that was an example of the clonus. So a quick stretch, and then the muscle continues to contract, contract rhythmically. It can be typically in the ankles, knees. Uh, hips and stuff. Overflow reactions, what you're doing on one side flows to the other side. Um, something or a part of your face or some other kind of movement. Stretch reflex, any time that you accidentally um, 
long stretch of muscle that'll contract it into spasticity afterwards. There might be an absence of primitive reflexes. So for example, the rooting reflex down there um, is where if you touch a baby's cheek what, around a baby's mouth on whatever side, they're gonna turn their head towards that side to find the nipple. So they may retain those primitive infantile reflexes after they have um, resolved and, and that we've grown past them. So for example, I mentioned the brooding reflex, the asymmetrical tonic neck reflex, that's where, um, we'll go over these more next semester, but it's where the baby will turn their head to look at something and the arm extends on the side they're looking towards and the other arm will come to the back of the head. I call it the, the referee reflex <clears throat> for that kind of a visual. So they may be um, delaying in their later reflexes that are supposed to emerge at a certain time, such as riding and equilibrium reflexes. Those are the reflexes that help keep our head in space, horizontal or parallel to the ground, and um, you know to keep us upright so we don't fall. So these postural abnormal abnormalities are caused by the tone. If we have fluctuating muscle tone, it can be very, very difficult to stabilize us into a standing position or to ambulate. Those reflex abnorm abnormalities integrate in that as well. So typically they have delayed motor development, motor, style, motor milestones delays, such as they'll be delayed in crawling, they won't crawl at all, um, they'll sit independently or the uh, being able to sit independently walking. Those are the delays that typically pick up why um, a person, why we may begin to suspect that maybe they're having um, some developmental problems. So while it's present in birth in all but um, <clears throat> approximately 10% of the cases, it's not often recognized until they fail to achieve these early motor milestones. So atypical, like I mentioned before, motor performance, unusual crawling, unusual walking, and coordinated reach. Oral motor difficulties such as sucking, swallowing, chewing. There's types of cerebral palsy. They're spastic, which can be hemiplegic, diplegic, or quadriplegic, meaning hemiplegic is one side, diplegic is the two lower extremities, quadriplegic or tetraplegic is all four extremities. 70%. 80% of the people with cerebral palsy are spastic. It's characterized by high tone, low movement. So they, um, like the little girl in the standing, Vicky in the standing table, she was a spastic cerebral palsy. Athetoid, 10 to 20% of the uh, clients with cerebral palsy are in this category. It's characterized by uncontrollable movements. Um, I would say the comedian, might be more typical of the athetoid. <clears throat> Ataxic, um, five to 10% balance problems and steadiness. Spastic CP, as we mentioned, one side, mainly the legs, whole body. Arm and legs for the hemiplegia, arm and legs on one side, usually the upper extremity is the most affected. It can be held in a spastic pattern. So go ahead and check out your book for a reference there. Um, nearly all are walking by their third birthday, but they may lack those riding and equilibrium reactions on involved sides and neglect that side. And the upper extremity may not be used functionally, or may, may or may not, but typically it's not. So we'll watch a little bit of this video, not the full nine minutes. You can see his left upper extremity there is when he's up and fisted. I'm going to turn the music down. Nice. Come on. So he has movement in his lower extremity. It's a little bit slower than the other. You can see here, whoops, sorry.
and stuff. Little skein there. So you see he's doing pretty good with his lower extremities, it's mainly his upper extremity there. Okay. That gives us an idea for the spastic hemiparesis or hemiplegia. So spastic diplegia, low, lower extremities, maybe mild. Sitting can be delayed up to um, three plus years for them to be able to sit. They may rely upon their arms support. support. Crawling can be done with the arms um, or may be done. Standing posture and gait's affected. But 85 to, of them walk independently by three to five. Another 10 to 15% might be able to walk with crutches and walker. So quadriplegic for spastic CP, entire body, arms typically display high flexor tone, legs are high extensor tone. The tonic labyrinthine reflex, TLR, may be present. I swear, depending upon where your position of your head is at, just tip back. Um, your shoulders retract, necks hyperextended. Um, if you have sensation on your back, if you have sensation on your pressure on your front, on your chest or tummy, you'll pull into a flexion. <clears throat> pattern and stuff, so whole body flexion. So only a small percentage can walk. Drooling, eating difficulties are very uh, eating difficulties are very common because um, our oral motor skills are our most fine motor skills, the highest level of fine motor skills. And obviously, I'm not mastering them very well today. Athetoid CP, 10 to 20%, slow writhing involuntary movements, abrupt jerky movements increase with emotional tension. That's for all cerebral palsy, not just athetoid. Uh, head trunk, oral mu musculature is often affected, low tone, fluctuating tone, and uh, typically wheelchair dependent. So let's watch for just a few seconds. Very difficult for them to bring their hands into midline that we typically need for that we typically need for um, okay. Whoops, I can't seem to stop it. <laughs> Let's pause. There we go. <laughs> Typical, right? Okay. So ataxic cerebral palsy, five to 10% unsteadiness, difficulties with balance, particularly when we're ambulating. So let's take a look. But before we do that, I gotta get rid of these because they're killing me. Okay, now we're back. We want to do the whole seven minutes.
Look at him go. Get the little rock star moving now, huh? <laughs> Excellent. So mixed form, spastic and acetoid, most common mixed form, acetoid and ataxic less common. So seizure disorders, so there's intellectual disability, seizure, visual hearing impairments. IDs, we talked about last week, 40 to 70% of the people with cerebral palsy also have an intellectual disability. It's most common with spastic quadriplegic less common and the others. Seizures, 25 to 60 percent of those with cerebral palsy have seizures, most often with spastic and quad triplegic hemiplegia, and hemi, excuse me, hemi and quad, and more common if there's cognitive deficits with it as well. It kind of goes hand in hand. Vision and hearing problems, they might have problems with crossed eyes, nystagmus, that's the, when our eyes twitch um, back and forth when we come off of like a merry-go-round or something like that. They may find it hard to track, visually track, fixate, or look upward because that's, that's off reflexes in their body. Immunopsia, we'll talk a little bit more about that in, cerebral, in CVA. That's um, where we have loss of vision in our field, visual fields. So. Hearing and loss, hearing loss in 12%, especially with the acetoid CPs. Um, we think that maybe excessive time spent laying now contributes fluid in the ears, middle ear infections. So it's lifelong. They'll continue to make motor gains of a smile to learn to compensate. Severe little progress may be made, so you have to go more towards the top-down approach. Secondary, such as contractures, may develop over time and lifespan average range. There's no, not, there's no single definitive test. It's a history is taken, movement, tone, reflexes are assessed by the doctor and the therapist, OTPT, and speech for oral motor. Other, uh, speech for oral motor, PT and OT for the other movements. Other possibilities are ruled out. A CT or MRI may be used to help understand where the damage has occurred in their brain. So, so um, and just remember that it may not be evident during the first months of life. So medication management, oral medications for spasticity reduction, such as diazepam <clears throat> and baclofen and Botox for reducing that spasticity. Splinting at night, you may be making resting splints for people. Soft splints to allow finger movements during the day, AFOs, ankle foot orthosis. Uh, progressive casting or contracture reversal, surgical tendon release, rhizotomy where they cut the, the nerve, hip reconstruction for dislocation because sometimes the contractures will pull the hips out of socket, and spinal fusion rod insertion to, to correct scoliosis. Movement, uh, other client factors, movement, voice and speech, sensory, spinal deformities, which affect our cardiovascular and respiratory, conditions and then cognitive. So what's the impact on performance? Well, it's going to affect plain leisure, plain leisure. You can just see how much more difficult it was for those babies and children to interact with their play environment. And remember the 
play for children is their work. So it's super important that we have all those adventures of grabbing things and putting them in our mouth and exploring and going up and down things and just learning all about the life around us. Obviously, ADLs and IADLs, school work productivity, productivity like we mentioned the other day for uh, core skills about the ADA uh, federal law that does have patients um, with cerebral palsy being part of the educational system. And then socialization, we had also talked about that too uh, for people. So very possible, communication, marriage, it depends upon the severity of it. Oh, that's it. That's all for now, folks. So very good. Those are, this is an example of lost strand crutches. Um, just so that you kind of know, we have a guest speakers coming in tomorrow and they'll talk a little bit about those, but that's an example of those. Okay, thank you. Thanks for joining.